obviously you're excited to get going after a bye week. I just want to start off by this is something for for years we've been asked to wear a, a patch on our uh, the coaches, and I'm not a big fan of just sticking patches on uh, shoulders. Um, and I found out more and more it's Duchenne muscular dystrophy research is why the coaches do this. It's called coaches for that. Yes. yes. And to be honest, I just didn't know much about it. I did it because I was told to do it, and. And I've become very close with two members of our team. I consider them Noah and uh, Jacob, who are stricken, stricken with this disease. And you know, we love them to death. And so we're going to do some special things for those guys this week. And I ask for everybody to get involved. There's so many great things to get involved with. But this one kind of hit home now that I, I've, I've never really knew much about the disease. And I do now. Uh, I, I say that not proud that I didn't know what it was. But I really am very familiar with because it hit home. It hit these two young people that are at our practice almost every day, and they're very close with us. So I want to start off by saying that. And uh, a very tough opponent this week, Cincinnati, I have a lot of respect for them. Uh, offensively, they're, they've are they been good in the past. They're exceptional now. You, uh, I saw firsthand live watching it that Friday night when they uh, just uh, put 400-plus yards in the air against Toledo, a very good, uh, a good team. And uh, they continued again this week with another good win against Miami, Ohio. So we have a lot of respect for their skill. Uh, the one thing that I still remember, Tommy Tupperville, Coach Tupperville saying that they're his best group of receivers that he's coached. And that struck a chord with me because I know what he's coached. He's coached some very good teams and some very good players. So uh, we got to be at our best Saturday. And I expect us to be that. Uh, with the bye week, we practiced Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday last week. We're back at it today, a plus one day. And uh, uh, we're ready to go. So I'll answer questions for you. Uh, front row left, Rusty. Um, is this particularly good in an early bye week when you've got a young quarterback like JT? Is this, giving just, is this by him more time or is it better than the game? I think that question shows up every time we have a bye week. Was this a good week? I, I don't know. It's uh, the earliest I think we've ever had one. Yeah, particularly for a first time quarterback starting off. And the other thing is you keep playing because he did get better that's, that week. So I, I don't know. I, I can't really didn't give any thought to it. If we got a bye week, we utilized it. We did a lot a lot differently. We operated a lot differently this bye week than we have in the past. You know, uh, we, we practiced a lot of game reps. And it wasn't just for him, but it was that offensive line. We're still trying to finalize the final five or the starting five for the offensive line. And, and they had to get better. And, and then obviously on defense have some uh, new players as well. So more game reps than we've ever done on a bye week. Just as a follow-up, Texas, uh, Arizona State, UCLA, Ohio State, you guys are all on backup quarterbacks. Is the importance of having a backup at that position now, I mean, it's always been important. Is it more so perhaps now because of responsibilities on a backup? I think it's always been, you know, you're a shoelace away from that guy going in the game. You know, we kind of got spoiled here with Kenny Guyton the last couple of years. And, and uh, yeah, I'm always, you know, we, we've, through, I'm just trying to think through my career, we've, you know, Alex Smith was a backup quarterback, took over and did very well. We had uh, Tebow was our backup to Chris Leak. He did very well. Kenny Guyton was our backup here. So that's always been a big concern. I, I think it's just, it's getting probably a little bit more exposure than ever in the past. You mentioned last week you have an obligation to get the five best offensive linemen on the field. You just touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, have you settled on a, a, a starting five for this game, and when do you hope to, to settle on the starting five? Well, Jacoby had a high ankle sprain. He should be full go today, so he limited reps last week. You know, Pat Elfline was dealing with some uh, uh, feet issues. Uh, both his – he had some arch problems in the in the summer, and they surfaced a little bit, but he's fine. He's 100%. So we just uh, – you know, the guy that's improved a little bit is Chase Ferris. And he's the backup right tackle. And if he's one of the top five, then he should be the backup right tackle. He should be the starting right guard. Um, so we're still, we have not made a final decision on that. And I'm not sure we will this game. I think we're going to play six guys uh, and get some rotation going. So pretty good battle between Ferris and Price there at, at right guard. Is yeah, Ferris and Price. And then also, uh, you know, Pat offline at center. You know, um, you got Joel Hale is continually battling. The guy that's made a big uh, jump start last week was Tony Underwood. We moved him to center when Chad Lindsey uh, stepped away because of injuries. So we're, we're it's in flux a little bit, but the positive is there's very capable personnel that's available to us. Second row left, Ari. Irvin, you spent a lot of time um, talking about the importance of keeping the top prospects in the 
stay in the state. Conversely, when you go out of the state and you're recruiting other top prospects in other states, how do you approach that and how do you recruit against you know other in-state schools of other programs that want to keep their kids in state? Well, how do you do it? You just recruit. I mean, that's the name of the game. But we'll we'll always recruit the footprint or the you know the the local as hard as we can. Um, the negative that's happened in recruiting is you're not getting that chance to watch guys develop. You know, everybody's committing so early in the last five, six, seven years. I mean, you know, I, I, I can't stand it. You know, I, I like to go watch kids play their senior year, and there's nothing better than your first bye week to go watch. We're going to watch juniors now. You know, you don't watch the seniors because most of them are all committed. You know, we're down to our last few scholarships for this class, and I can't remember it ever being like that. A couple schools would do that, but a lot of times you're getting your commitments in December and January. Now it's December, January, but it's of their junior year. So you're not even getting to watch them play their senior year, watch them develop. And uh, so to answer your question, we're you know, in-state recruiting is primary. Out of state, you kind of cherry pick. We have great respect for certain states, and we've had success and great ties. You know, Jersey, Georgia, Florida are all the places where we've drawn players from. But then all of a sudden, you know, Virginia now, you know, with Jalen Holmes. So you just try to uh, uh, go first of all where the best players are, and second where you have connections or where there's an interest. And uh, you'll get a Raekwon McMillan or a Vaughn Bell. You say that you know it's important early on in there when they're when you're being recruited by your home state school, it's easier to develop that talent or to notice that talent earlier. I would assume you can mention how much quicker things are. How does that change? Does it change at all when you're going out to places like Georgia and Virginia to not be able to get in? You know, when home state schools are getting in their freshmen and sophomores now. Well, it's just, there's a challenge. I mean, but it's obviously we've done okay with that. Uh, but there's a challenge. You know, the thing that happens in state is schools are, I mean, there, there are schools that offer 150 kids, you know, not just the state of Ohio, but, you know, we can't do that because what if they all come? You know, we got a problem there. And so that's one of the problems in state where all of a sudden, you know, well, this school came and offered me, coach, why didn't you offer me? Well, they've offered 75 other guys too. And we get in a little bit of a rut because they'll say, why didn't you offer us? Well, we're going to. Let us watch you play, and then we'll offer you. So that's kind of what's going on in the last few years in recruiting. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but. No, that's interesting. Thank you. Given your background, Cincinnati's probably not just another school to you, obviously. Could you uh, describe the, the difference between what Cincinnati is now compared to when you went there? And even when you played them in the bowl game? Any sure, emotional sure, uh, uh, very strong emotional. My sister's uh, associate provost at Cincinnati. My other sister was a homecoming queen there. And obviously my dad and my grandfather, just strong history at, at UC. Uh, Cincinnati's kind uh, has had a very similar transformation of the academic reputation that Ohio State went through. You know, I was there at some called U College, and it was open enrollment, and it was just a big state school. and. Uh, my sister lets me know all the time that it's not that way anymore. It's a very high-end uh, uh, academic institution, and which has always had a great reputation, but just the administration a lot like Ohio State. I'd be a great study what's happened to the, you know, the two biggest, the two largest school in-state schools, how much they've grown um, yeah, as far as admission requirements. Uh, very similar trajectory as far as, you know, we're up to 29-30 average ACT. I don't know Cincinnati's, but I know they're, have uh, done very well as, as well. So there's a strong tie, a lot of respect, and uh, Cincinnati is a great town. It's a great university. And in terms of the football program now? Oh, my goodness, football. yeah. Uh, that started, I, I, I was very aware of the transformation. It actually started with uh, Coach Murphy, um, who's at Harvard, I believe, now. But you saw a transformation of the program where they started investing into the facilities. And, yeah, the facility we, when I played there, was, it wasn't very strong. And they made a, a decision, a commitment, and obviously have had great rewards for it. Third row left, Bill. Can you talk a little bit about your experience playing there? What the program was like? Not a lot of experience. Uh, I played professional baseball out of high school and uh, uh, did that for a couple of years and then made a decision to play football. Uh, Cincinnati, I probably wasn't a good enough player to go there, but I did play a little bit and then just went right into coaching afterwards. So we were not very, you know, it wasn't a great experience. We weren't very good, and uh, uh, but I, I still have great friends and, and uh, good memories from my time there. Your decision to hire Kerry Combs from Cincinnati, what went into that? Why, why did you want 
Well, a lot of it was Cincinnati, but more is Kerry Combs. I don't want to you know, devalue Kerry. Kerry's an excellent football coach. I knew him from his days at Coleraine. Uh, for some reason, I remember people, I don't, because when we were here back in 86, 87, we had Carlos Snow, Greg Fry, um, Vinnie Clark. Um, there's another player, Jay Cook. So we had Tom Lichtenberg recruited Cincinnati, and I, I, there's some kind of, there was a story that Ohio State couldn't recruit the Cincinnati player. And I was like, I, I got real defensive. Like, what are you talking about? We used to always get the best players from Cincinnati. And so when I heard that, you know, when we had a spot open, and that was part of the decision to hire Kerry, but not the only reason. Kerry's an excellent coach. But Cincinnati recruiting, and we've done pretty well down there. Uh, we hope to continue to do very well, because that's as, that's as good a football as there is. Urban, there's a lot of talk in Cincinnati with the conference uh, changes, membership in recent years. They, you know, people see them as looking on the outside end as a Power Five conference. Do you do you see Cincinnati football as a Power Five conference? Absolutely. What, what what makes it a Power Five conference? Well, it's the uh, the marketplace that you know you're talking about TV sets. You're talking about uh, there's a nice tradition at Cincinnati. And uh, the recent tradition has been real good, too, uh, with uh, what Coach Kelly, you know, it started with Coach Dantone. I mean, the coaching uh, tree that has developed in the last 25 years has been pretty remarkable and the success they've had. So, yeah, I was surprised that they weren't invited into a Power Five. I don't know the whole story. Is that even the right term, Power Five? The Big Five conferences. And, and uh, I think, you know, we certainly respect them as if they are. I don't. No, we you know we when we're watching film, they're certainly as good as a lot of the other teams that we've gone up against. Front row left, Doug. Urban, we talked so much about the pass defense in the off season. Three games in now. Yeah. Uh, Here we go. You've evaluated it. Is it as has it come as far as you wanted it to? Is it good enough at this point? Well, we haven't. You know, uh, the the first game was wishbone. Second game, we didn't play. We played pretty good. I think we held 190 some yards passing. Not great. And then the last game was, you know, was out of hand really early. So we have not. This is the test. This is the one that we're all kind of shooting for and they're really good in throwing the ball and it'll be a challenge for us. So uh, I can't make that evaluation yet after the first three games. And obviously you're playing a, a very good in-state Ohio team this week. Very good. But when you, when you went to Florida, <clears throat> I'm sure you went there knowing that there were two other national championship caliber programs in that state, Miami and Florida State. At Ohio State, Ohio State is that team. Is there is there anything different about that, coaching here versus coaching at Florida, coaching at a school where it's obviously clear Ohio State's the dominant team in the state versus when you went to Florida, there's three teams that are fighting to be the dominant team in that state. Does it make anything different, whether it's in recruiting or attention or – anything at all about the program? Uh, interesting question. I'm just trying to think. Um, you know, when you – at Florida, you when you walked in a home, it was either a Knoll, a Kane, or a Gator. You know, it was – and it was 33%. You know, what am I getting into here? And usually you look on the wall and you figure out where you're at. Uh, and that's – you know, that was it. You come walk in and say, doggone it. Or you'd see them, you know, they do this and it would be a good day for you. Uh, you walk in and do this, we have a little issue or that. So, so right away you'd find out, you know, here I think more in Southern Ohio, you'll, you'll see some, uh, a lot of UC allegiance, you know, to say that we get in a ton of recruiting battles with them. We have a few, not to the same caliber that we did down there, but uh, I see that continuing to, you know, as, as UC continues to elevate their game, which they've done, I can see that happening down the road. Second row, left end, Dave. Urban, just, just with, Noah, <clears throat> with Noah Spence returning to practice, how, how do you kind of balance the belief in the good of a kid versus what appears to be multiple core violation, zero tolerance issues? And I, is there a part of you that says, I don't want to hear any excuses, you're done? Or I guess, how do you weigh all that? Uh, that's a, another good question. He's not going to practice now. Uh, that was just uh, last week. Um, so he's not practicing. He's getting full-time treatment. He is working out. Uh, just for his well-being. Uh, I, I think that's a good question. When is a zero tolerance, you know, when uh, an addiction is set in or, or whatever, a decision to, to harm yourself and harm your teammate. Those are all that we wrestle with all the time. You know, I've been criticized for many, many years about I treat these guys like they're my kid. You know, and and uh, I'm not a big fan of dismissal. 
I just don't do that very often. You know, it's got to be a severe, uh, severe one. You know, where you're hurting someone else. Or, but, um, you know, I, I, I'm doing the best we can. We, not I. We are the Ohio State University or a group of it. It's an institution based on educating people. So we're doing our very best uh, to you know, what the future holds for. No, I have no idea. But to throw him to the street, I didn't feel like that was appropriate just yet. And we're going to do the best we can to help a guy that was a academic all Big Ten, you know, good student, great family, that has a problem, and it's our job to help him. And I don't think you'll ever see our staff ever do that. So you're out in that kind of a situation. Now, unfortunately, sometimes it's not our decision. Well, it's been a process. He has really done a nice job. He uh, was the mistake guy. Every third play, he'd go the wrong way or make a mistake and come up with some excuse. His maturity, you know, his dad got real involved. In, in, you know, and the good thing, I, I love having conversations with dads about, not the third uncle, but dads about what, what's, what we need to do to move on. And I think it was very productive. This is one of those good stories that, uh, why is my son not playing? Well, here's why. Okay, let's fix it. Not well, we're going to move him out of here. So he's reaping the rewards of a combined effort with his position coach, with his family, and with the head coach and strength coach of this is what you need to do, Mike. And uh, to give him credit, he's done it. Were you, were you all tempted at that time last fall to put him back out there over those problems? No. No, he didn't uh, perform well. You know, we, we made a decision last year. It wasn't to save him. You know, we don't do that. If he's the best player, he wasn't the best player. And we saw some immaturity that he needed to mature, and he showed signs of it. So I know we did the right thing, and so does he know he's at the right thing. We just have to, you know, every day's a new day, and he's got to continue that same work ethic that's got him where he's at right now. That's, he's, he's a great story. It's one of the great ones of coaching that you see a kid mature and turn into a young man. Yeah, Urban, uh, two questions. Number one, Gunnar Keel, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Because obviously, even though you you spend time with your offense, you've got to see him on that Friday night. Right. Is he the kind of guy that just stands there and just wants to pick you apart? How would you describe him? I see a very strong guy. He looks big. You know, he looks big, strong arms and, and uh, uh, throws in the, you know, very courageous player that he throws into the uh, oncoming pass rush. Uh, he's, you know, at, like most really, really good quarterbacks, he's got really good personnel around him. Really good. So uh, I see I see one of the top quarterbacks in the country. And the other thing, last year when things just kept getting, it seemed, at least from our vantage point, worse and worse with pass defense with you. Now, did it almost drive you crazy? I mean, what, what was it like dealing with that? And what are the signs that tell you you think y'all got it straight? Well, I think last year uh, when Christian went down, we had a, a void. You know, not just in playmaking ability, but leadership. And we didn't have that answer, or the answer is too young. So number one is I've pushed our coaches extremely hard to get the young players ready to go. You can see us pushing Raekwon McMillan, and, and uh, you know, it's just not acceptable to have talented young players and say they don't know what they're doing. We'll teach them what they're doing. So that's number one. Number two is I feel we're very systematic now. You know, last year we had some errors, and we would, you know, we would change week to week to fix what was a weakness. Uh, we have a system. You know, I, I really like our system right now. I believe in it. Uh, we need to see it executed this week, uh, but it's more systematic, if that makes sense. Two more questions. Back row left, uh, Rob. Urban, you did the HBO special. What prompted you to do that? What was the decision behind that? And uh, what good comes from that? Is it just a reminder of what you don't want to be anymore? Or? Oh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> good question. I, I don't know why I did that. Uh, um, Andrea Kramer is a young lady's name that did the and I had we get a lot of phone calls to do this, do this, do this, and this. You know, Trace Armstrong, a very good friend of mine who helps me with some stuff, said, you know, this is first class. It's 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 a good story for families and people, and it might be good to do it. Uh, I look back now, and I mean, it was a positive experience. You know, I don't know why we. To answer your question, I don't know that. I can't say, hey, let's go do this. You know, it came across my desk. I said, no, of course not. And then I got a couple of phone calls. I said, yeah, I do. It'd be good for you know people to see and all that. So that's why. And last question, uh, Todd, front row, middle. Rick Irving, you get a lot of young players, especially on the offensive side of the ball, playing. Sort of references in Tim's question a little bit. At what point in time, though, this is the fourth game of the season, what point in time is lack, lack of experience 
you know, no longer a good excuse you know, at the head coach's desk to, to say, hey, this guy. After week one, I mean, it's, we're not a big, I don't hope that you guys feel that we are not a big excuse program. You know, we're not a blame. We don't blame. We don't, because you know, if I hear that and if you hear me say, say coach, don't, I try to never go there. Um, and I warn our staff, I hear that in our coaching staff, or when I say, how are our players? Don't worry, well, you have a new quarterback. No, you don't. He's a, he's a veteran player now. So we, we try not to go there. Uh, I, if, you, if I hear, I don't listen to read a lot of stuff, but if Jerry says, you know, Coach Schickel or Coach Herman are making excuses for a lack of experience, then I'll sit with a coach. I've never really had to do that. So I think those are long gone. If it's coming, it's certainly not coming from this building, I hope. Uh, about young players. I mean, that's. I'm not saying you guys use it. I'm just saying. I mean, it's, it's real, though. I mean, if. Yeah, but it's not real anymore. You've played. Uh, you played a prime time game. You've played uh, the wishbone. You've played. You know, you've week four. So it's it's as far as I'm concerned, it was over after week one. Uh, the offensive line has to perform at a very high level. It's because it's an Ohio State standard. I know we. I mean, I don't. The good thing is, I never hear that uh, around here. You know, if if that's on the outside, that's on the outside. Coach, thank you. Very thank much. you.